Welcome back, scientists. This is Ms. Shetha from Seattle, Washington, bringing to you Lesson 6 of Natural Selection. Now, if you haven't had a chance to watch Lesson 4 or Lesson 5, make sure you go back and watch those two lessons, which will help everything come together a little bit more. So here we go with Lesson 6 of Natural Selection. Here's what you'll need for this lesson. A pencil or pen, some lined or blank paper, an optional but encouraged, a family member, friend, or a pet you can check in with, and a Lesson 6 packet that was provided to you by your teacher. Let's go ahead and warm up. Pause the video and read Sherman story number three right here on the right-hand side. Turn and talk to a friend, a family member, or jot your responses down on a piece of paper about the following questions. What do you think Sherman is right about? And what do you think Sherman is wrong about? Carefully read um, the dialogue between the two characters and see where do they go right and where do they go wrong? Here's what I notice here. In our illustration, we have green dragonflies and brown dragonflies. Now, what we know is that in this environment, many years of lots of rain cause the environment to become very lush and green. Now, Sherman understands clearly that the brown dragonflies all got eaten because their predator could see them more easily in the green environment. And he understands that green, therefore, is an adaptive trait for the green dragonflies. And that's because being green helps them to camouflage and thus survive and reproduce more. Now, what Sherman doesn't have correct here is when he says the very same green dragonflies are still alive today. That's not true. What we see is that these green dragonflies must be as a result of being the offspring of green dragonflies generations ago. We know that those green dragonflies probably have died and thus um, the offspring carries on the trait which was adaptive for being green because it could survive and reproduce more. And thus in the environment, now we have more green than brown dragonflies. We are now going to read an article called The Deadly Dare. Follow along with me as we learn more about the poison that rough skin newts carry. The Deadly Dare Rough skin newt defenses. In 1979, friends dared a 29 year old man in Oregon to swallow a living rough skinned newt. The man didn't realize how poisonous rough skinned newts are. A lethal, fast acting poison called tetrodotoxin, or TTX, oozes from their skin. The man swallowed the newt whole and started feeling weak a few minutes later. He described a numb feeling all over his body. His friends tried to take him to a hospital, but he refused. Just 20 minutes later, the man was dead. Of course, the newt the man swallowed died too. In that particular case, being poisonous didn't help that individual newt survive. If newts have to be eaten in order to defend themselves, being poisonous doesn't sound like a very good defense. How is being poisonous having a high level of TTX poison, an adaptive trait for a rough-skinned newt. All right, so I'm seeing here that tetrodotoxin is the name of the poison that oozes from the rough-skinned newt uh, skin, and we are going to be talking about that a lot more in terms of how having this high level of TTX poison is in fact a good defense and an adaptive trait. Why poison is adaptive? One reason TTX is adaptive is that it acts quickly. A predator that tries to eat a poisonous newt may become sick before it's able to kill the newt, allowing the newt to escape. In fact, TTX acts so quickly that sometimes predators die before finishing their meals. Scientists have observed rough skin newts crawling out of dead or paralyzed predators. Even more important, 
Predators can, t can smell and taste TTX poison. The main predator of rough-skinned newts is the garter snake. Scientists have found evidence that garter snakes use their senses of smell and test to tell whether a rough-skinned newt is too poisonous to eat. They have even observed garter snakes doing quick taste tests, licking rough-skinned newts before deciding whether to eat them. That's really interesting, and I want to make a note here because I'm having a question about how they observe that. So I'm going to document my question right here. How did scientists observe this? How did they know that the garter snakes were choosing which newts to eat. Scientists have studied whether garter snakes are able to detect TTX poison in newts. Biologists have placed one newt and one garter snake together in a cage to see whether the snake would eat the newt. Oh, okay, so that's how they were testing um, how these garter snakes detect the newt poison. They put a newt and a garter snake in a cage together and then documented um, what happened afterwards. They have tried this test over and over again using different snakes and different newts. Even though the newts are placed directly in front of the snakes, not every newt gets eaten. Biologists are able to consider the cause and effect relationship between high poison levels and survival in newts by examining a population of newts with high variation. The newts in the test range from having no poison to having very, very high levels of TTX in their bodies. Okay, so they were able to have a range of newts with different poison levels and therefore determine the relationship between um, the garter snakes being able to detect the poison um, because they were able to see which newts that the garter snakes could eat, or chose to eat, I should say. In these tests, the snakes consistently eat the newts with the lowest levels of TTX, and do not eat the newts with the high levels of TTX. So this is part of the evidence that they're, they gathered here. So let's make sure we document that by underlining it in our reading. These results are evidence that garter snakes can detect TTX and that they prefer to eat rough skin newts with lower levels of TTX. The more poisonous a rough skin newt is, the less likely it is to be eaten by a garter snake. So, because they had a, a large variation of newts with different poison levels, they could see then how the snakes would react. And they're con they concluded that the more poisonous the rough skewed newt is, the less likely it was to be eaten by a garter snake. So the snakes only ate newts with low levels of TTX and chose not to eat the newts with high levels of TTX. That means high levels of TTX are an adaptive trait in rough skin newts that live near garter snakes. So it seems like they're saying here that high levels of TTX are adaptive because they're allowing the newt to survive more because from the test, they could see the garter snakes would choose not to eat the newts with high levels of TTX. So therefore it must be adaptive because it allows the newts to survive longer. Oh, on this page here, I see this picture and I'm wondering what that is. So. I am going to read the caption so that I can figure that out. A rough skin newt's poison is a type called tetrodotoxin, or TTX for short. This is a model of a molecule of TTX. Oh, okay, so this helps me understand that TTX is a molecule, so it's definitely very small. And I remember that when scientists have something very small that they cannot see, they tend to make models out of it so they, they, they can visualize it a little bit better. So I can see here now that this is a model of TTX poison that we have been reading about. How adaptive traits spread? 
If snakes are in its environment, a poisonous newt is less likely to die from being eaten than a newt that isn't poisonous. The newts that don't get eaten have a better chance of living longer, and that's important because it means more chances to reproduce. Organisms have to reproduce in order to pass on their genes, which are the instructions for making protein molecules that determine traits. If they don't reproduce, their traits die with them. Wow, that's really important. I'm going to make a flowchart to help me remember that. So what this is saying here is that organisms survive and when they are able to do that because they have this adaptive trait of being poisonous, they're able to survive and then reproduce. And when they reproduce, they're able to pass down their genes to their offspring. Okay, that helps me kind of recognize a little bit more about the relationship between all of these processes. Let's see how this helps us understand how being poisonous in the new population um, became more common. In the new population, more poisonous newts are more likely to survive long enough to reproduce and pass down their genes. And therefore, the trait of being poisonous to the next generation. Okay, so these organisms that are surviving are in fact poisonous newts. So these poisonous newts are then able to reproduce and pass on this gene for being highly poisonous to their offspring. As a result, there will be more and more highly poisonous rough skin newts in each generation. This will cause the distribution in the population to change over many generations. Scientists call this process natural selection. Okay, here is the main word of our unit, folks, natural selection. And this in-text definition says it is, in fact, a, dis a change in the distribution of traits in a population over many generations. This process does not only happen in rough-skinned newts, it has been observed in populations of different species all over the world. Okay, so this is how um, natural selection ties into everything. The organisms that survive are those that are most poisonous, and therefore they then reproduce and they are passing down their genes of being highly poisonous to their offspring. And then those offspring are now poisonous. And then they, the ones that are most poisonous will then reproduce. And then they pass down their genes to their offspring, causing a change in the distribution of poison level over a period of time. And that is what we call natural selection. So now I'm wondering what other organisms uh, experience natural selection, this change in distribution of traits over generations. Let's find out. Other poisonous organisms. Being poisonous is an adaptive trait for many different organisms, not just rough skinned newts. There are many poisonous plants such as deadly nightshade, hemlock, and mint. Wow, mint, not something I would have expected. You might be surprised to see mint on this list since you've probably eaten mint yourself. The poisons in mint are harmless to humans, but deadly to some plant-eating insects. These poisons are what give mint its minty taste and smell. They are warning signals to tell insects to stay away. Like rough skinned newts, poisonous plants are poisonous as defense against being eaten. Plants can't run away from animals that want to eat them, so they have to defend themselves in other ways with adaptive traits like tough bark, sharp thorns, and being poisonous. Wow, I never thought of a plant as having a defense mechanism. Here are a couple of examples on the left. Let's read a little bit more about them. A deadly nightshade, which is here on the left, is an extremely poisonous plant. Eating just a few berries can kill a human. Mint, on the right, I've definitely seen that before, 
is a harmless to humans, but deadly to some insects. Here are some other plants that I kind of recognize from some of my adventures. Acacia thorns, redwood bark, and cactus spines. Cactus spines I definitely knew about, and um, I have definitely experienced how sharp they are before. Besides poison, plants' defenses include sharp thorns and thick bark. So those provide protection for the plants from being eaten, um, sometimes maybe from being eaten by humans. We just finished reading the Deadly Dare article, and let's make sure that we comprehend some of the main important points. Grab your pen or pencil, grab your notebook or piece of paper, whatever you've been taking notes on, and turn and talk to a friend or family member or jot your responses down on the piece of paper about the following questions. Number one, what is the definition of natural selection? Number two, in the study that scientists conducted, where garter snakes were paired with newts in a cage. Why did the garter snake sometimes eat the newt, but other times did not? And number three, how did more highly poisonous newts end up in the population generation after generation? Why is every generation more poisonous than gen the generation before? Go ahead, grab your pen or pencil, and let's make sure we comprehend some of these important parts of the reading. Let's go ahead and tackle these questions together. Number one, what is the definition of natural selection? Keyword in our unit, right? Grab your pen or pencil. We're going to go over this definition together. Natural selection is the process by which the distribution of traits in a population changes over many generations. So I remember in our context, what we're talking about here is poison level. So the, the change in our population of newts from becoming less poisonous to more poisonous, that is an example of natural selection happening. That process of what is going on there is natural selection because there's a change in the, in the distribution of the trait of poison level. Question number two. In the study that scientists conducted where garter snakes were paired with newts in a cage, why did the garter snake sometimes eat the newt but other times did not? Well, from our reading in the article, it said that garter snakes can detect the poison level of rough skin newts by smelling and tasting the TTX poison. And sometimes garter snakes ate the newt because they understood that it was a low enough TTX poison level where they would still be able to survive when they ate the newt. Comparatively, they chose not to eat the newt when they detected the poison level is too high, knowing that they would not be able to survive after eating that particular newt with the high poison level. So that's why um, sometimes they ate the newt and sometimes they didn't. Question number three, how did more highly poisonous newts end up in the population generation after generation? Why is every generation more poisonous than the generation before? Well, we know that having the trait for poison is an adaptive trait and helps the newts to be able to survive longer. And when they survive longer, they're able to reproduce. And in that process of reproduction, they are passing down their genes to their offspring and specifically the gene for having the trait of high poison level. So they're passing down those genes which are providing the instructions for making the protein that carries the trait for having a high poison level. So their offspring then have this trait for high poison level and then that continues back into the cycle. Those offspring are surviving, they're reproducing, and then passing on their genes for poison level to their offspring as well. So that's how this process goes in terms of uh, poison level being passed down generation to generation and therefore allowing the population to reflect that as well. We're gonna see a diagram in the next slide that will help us illustrate this a little bit more concisely. 
I can see the title of this diagram is um, How Natural Selection Works. And there are lots of different symbols here, so I'm going to make sure I read the key and understand what each of these symbols means. Um, these red dots symbolize um, the amount of TTX poison, and X symbolizes death, and these little lines that kind of look like a track uh, mean reproduction. So let me look at each panel here and um, see what I notice and what's going on. There are different inherited traits in the population. Okay, so this is my whole population of newts, and I have five newts with uh, one dot to symbolize a low amount of poison. I have five newts with kind of a medium amount of poison. They have three dots, and then I have uh, five newts with six dots to indicate a high poison level. In panel two, it says adaptive traits help organisms survive in their environment. Organisms with adaptive traits are more likely to survive long enough to reproduce. Okay, so I remember poison level is adaptive. So um, that definitely is demonstrated in what I'm seeing here. Those newts with a low poison level with only one dot, um, many of them have died, and even some of the newts with a medium poison level have died as well. And one newt with a high poison level has also died. However, those newts that still exist have been able to reproduce. So um, there's one newt with a low poison level that was able to reproduce. Um, two dudes with a medium poison level that were able to reproduce, and then four out of the five with a high poison level were able to reproduce. So the organisms that reproduce pass on their traits to the next generation. So I can see here, this is now what my population might look like. These four newts have reproduced, and so now we have a larger number of newts with a higher poison level, and the medium newts have also reproduced, so then we have a larger number of newts with a medium poison level, and even the one with a low poison level has also reproduced, so there's still lots of variation in this population, but the distribution of poison level definitely is leaning towards those with high poison level, which totally makes sense because poison level is an adaptive trait that helps these newts survive and therefore reproduce. And um, so we can see that the survival of these newts allowed them the opportunity to reproduce, which we can see in the final panel here in this population um, that we end with. I want you to turn and talk to a friend or family member. Jot your responses down on a piece of paper um, with your pen and your notebook or lined paper. And I want you to explain in your own words, why are there more newts with high poison level in the population in diagram three, so these newts here, why are there a higher number of uh, newts with a high poison level in this diagram compared to the diagram one here where we only have this many newts with a high poison level? Turn and talk to your neighbor or a family member here pause the video and I want you to try and explain this in your own words. When we talk to someone and explain it in our own words, we are therefore able to um, uh, understand a little bit more about what's happening here. So pause the video now, talk with someone, and we'll come back in just a second to understand what we learned. All right, I hope you were able to explain in your own words to your friend or your family member that there were more newts in this population in diagram three than in this population in diagram one because those newts had the adaptive trait of high poison level that allowed them to survive longer and thus have the opportunity to reproduce more. So because these newts were able to survive, they were able to reproduce and therefore caused a 
higher number of newts with high poison level in the ending population. And what we can extract from this is this key concept. Grab your pen or pencil and your notebook or your line paper or your tracker, wherever you're keeping track of these key concepts. And we can extrapolate this from what we just saw in that diagram. Individuals with adaptive traits are more likely to live longer and have offspring. Individuals with non-adaptive traits are more likely to die without having offspring. We also saw that in our simulation from last lesson as well. Those organisms with adaptive traits, whether that be poison level or uh, the adaptive trait of uh, uh, australope color that match the environment, those organisms are able to live longer and then have offspring. And the individuals with non-adaptive traits, whether that be a low poison level or a australope color that does not match the environment, they're going to be eaten quicker and they're more likely then to die without having offspring. This information that we just gathered from our article, as well as from this diagram that we just analyzed together, will help us as we circle back to our chapter two question below. And that chapter two question was, how do individuals in a population get their traits? Pause the video right now, and I want you to turn to someone near you, talk to someone, you can text someone if you want, and respond to this question now that we have the understandings that we have about natural selection and how individuals in a population get, get their traits. So pause the video and respond to this question, discuss it with someone so that um, we can further develop our understanding and our scientific skills of explanation. This is really exciting. We just got another message from Dr. Alex Young, who's a head biologist at Oregon State Park. Let's see what he has to tell us. I hope you're making progress in your investigation of the poison, poisonous rough skin newts. We're hoping to share your explanation with park visitors as soon as possible. Can you explain what you know so far about the newt population? We would really appreciate if you could send over a scientific argument that connects your evidence to your claim and reasoning. That will really help our visitors understand more about the newts. So it seems like he wants us to create an explanation that these visitors can um, understand as they learn more about newts and the other organisms in the park. I'm sure you all remember how to write a scientific argument, but let's just do a little refresher. In a scientific argument, we always start with a question about the natural world. For us, that question is, how did the rough skin newt population become more poisonous over time? We then make a claim, which is a proposed answer to a question about the natural world. And then we support that claim with evidence. Evidence is information about the natural world that is used to support or go against or refute the claim. And we can use evidence, which comes from our articles and our reading, the simulations that we have done together, and anything else that you might want to incorporate into this argument that supports the claim that we have done or seen in this unit. We then use scientific reasoning, folks. We, we talk about those scientific principles that support our evidence and connect that evidence to the claim. The claim that we are going to make for this scientific argument is the following. The claim is the new population became more poisonous because the snakes in this environment cause poison to be an adaptive trait and poison level 10 is the most common because the newts with this trait we're able to live longer and reproduce more than other newts. So I wanna challenge you to write a scientific argument that responds to this question 
and supports this claim. You can even write your own version of this claim if you would like and support it with evidence and reasoning. You may want to share this with your teacher or a family member or a friend as well um, as you are sharpening those scientific argumentation skills. Grab a pen or pencil, grab some paper. You can also type this if you um, want to and challenge yourself by writing a scientific argument that helps us respond to this unit phenomena about how the rough skin newt population became more poisonous over time. Let's summarize what we learned in this lesson. Poison can serve as an adaptive trait if predators detect the poison before killing their prey. Organisms with adaptive traits are less likely to die than organisms with non-adaptive traits, which means that they have more opportunities to reproduce. And individuals with adaptive traits are more likely to live longer and have offspring. Individuals with non-adaptive traits are more likely to die without having offspring. Make sure you include some of these in your written scientific arguments. You might also want to include some of the key concepts, which are scientific principles that can serve as reasoning to connect your evidence with your claim. Thanks for joining me for lesson six in our natural selection unit.